Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. You don't like to sell. You don't like sales. You don't like salespeople. You don't like any of this crap. But what if you were able to sell different? I have the man. I have the guy, Mr. Lee Saltz. Welcome back to the show. David, thank you so much. So you have you have six books that are out there. Uh, yes. Two of them are on sales differentiation. Uh, one is actually called Sales Differentiation. Yes. And the latest and greatest is the follow-up book, Sell Different. Sell you Different. You mean this one? We're yes. winning. Yes. Baby, we're winning today. You got the red book and the blue book. Talk to us about your professional journey and what brought you to the the cause and the mission of Sell Different. That's, that's a, a great question. Um, I did not enter this world planning to be a salesperson. I actually went to college and my plan was to go to law school and got into college and fell in love with the fitness industry. I was managing a gym while I was a full-time student. Loved it. But David, I quickly figured out there's no money to be made in the fitness industry. It's tough. And said, you know, uh, yeah, it, well, it is. There, there's just, there's nothing there. But I said, I'm going to make this my hobby. I mean, even today, I, I still compete in powerlifting. But the sales thing, this, that's really where I, I started learning sales. There's something here. I'm really intrigued by it. And that really set me on on my journey. So I'm curious between the, and this is not a wise guy question, although it will sound like a wise guy question. Yeah. Between the two sales differentiation books, how are they different? Book one and book two. Right sell there, different, right. uh, sell yeah. different, which is the latest, and then the the previous one, sales differentiation. Well, you, you, you said you're not putting me on the spot, but it's exactly what you just did. I mean, <laughs> David, I come on your show second time, and we've only been talking a couple of minutes, and you're asking me what's different about my book. Is that a fair question? No. Actually, David, it is. <laughs> For those of you who are in sales, whether buyers ask you that question point blank like David did or not, that's the huge question on their mind every time they meet with you. They want to know what's different. And if you can't articulate it, if you can't demonstrate it, you know what wins the day, David? Price. Low yes. price. And that's only good news if you're the low price provider. So what's different about sell different? Well, there's several things. For so many salespeople, Sales has never been more challenging than it is today. When you look at the differences in features and functions, they become so narrow. It's harder to differentiate what you're selling. But at the same time, executives aren't lowering their expectations of salespeople. I mean, David, have you heard of a sales manager saying, hey, I know it's tough out there. We're going to lower your quota by 50%. Go ahead and sell the deal at 30% lower margin. We're cool with that. Anybody saying that? Never. No. Your quote is up 50%. Don't you dare sacrifice margin when bringing in business to us. Well, how do you do that? How do you, and, and I trademarked this expression, how do you win more deals at the prices you want when, when you have these types of challenges? Well, you have to sell different. And what does that mean? It means looking at every touch point, every interaction you have with a buyer and looking for ways to outsmart, outmaneuver, and outsell the competition. And you can do it. And this book helps you do exactly that. And, and I get into everything from how you generate leads, referrals, discovery, virtual selling. You know, David, there wasn't going to be a chapter on virtual selling when I first wrote the book proposal. And then this little thing happened. What was that called again? Oh, right, the pandemic. Yeah, so we needed to have a, a, a chapter on virtual selling. Um, how to deal with the ultimate deal killer, fear of change, and much, much more. And, and the focus of Sell Different has nothing to do with what you're selling, but it's strategies and techniques that help you outsmart, outmaneuver, and outsell the competition in tough times. Another aspect that's different, if you read a sales book before, you know, a lot of times you read them like, wow, this is great stuff, but I got to hire the guy if I want to implement any of it. Yeah. So one of my objectives with this and the feedback that I've received, sounds like I've, I've achieved this, is for every chapter to stand on its own, that you could read it and immediately put it into practice without having to hire me. How's that? Absolutely. Totally right. Well, and the, uh, we're going to talk about a lot of things in here, but early in the book, and there's gems yes. really throughout, 
you talk about a, I believe it's a 13 or 14 touch point initial prospecting schedule of literally day one, do this, day two, do this, day three, take yes. a break, day four, do this. And it is literally step-by-step step, as granular as it can possibly be. Yes. Most salespeople, most consultants, most professional services sellers, they think they know how to sell, but the problem is they were taught how to sell like everybody else out of all the old school sure. playbooks that are slimy and pushy and weird. And mm -hmm. one of the things I want to ask you about, Lee, yeah. you are really uh, focused on making the sales experience itself to have a wow factor. Talk about Absolutely. some things that add a wow factor to a sales experience from the prospect standpoint. Absolutely. And, and I'll, I'll share it with you in the context of my son, Stephen. Uh, and because this story really does help to understand the opportunity we have with the buying experience. When he was a junior in high school, he had aspirations of playing college baseball. And while he had those aspirations, my wife, Sharon, and I would say, hey, Stephen, you need to set up college visits. And he's a little slow in doing so. I've come to find that a lot of kids are a little slow in scheduling those college visits. Well, the summer between his junior and senior year, he was asked to play on our city's American Legion baseball team. And if you're not familiar with American Legion, this is where all the college scouts come looking for top talent. And during a one-week tournament, David, he hit four home runs and three doubles. We didn't have to ask Stephen to schedule college visits anymore. The colleges were now coming to us. And if you've been through a college recruiting experience before, you know it's a sale. These coaches are trying to sell you on their institution, but they can't differentiate what they're selling. They can't add a major. They can't build a dorm. They can't move the campus. Gosh, they can't even change the meal plan. The opportunity that every one of them has is to sell different. And the way they have that opportunity is in the experience they create when they're recruiting candidates. Now, David, you know, when you first visit a college, as soon as you cross the border onto the campus, your blood pressure jumps about 30 points. Do you know totally. why that is? You know why that is? It's not the tuition. Any guesses? Um, uh, excitement, adrenaline, nope. anticipation. No, 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 no. David, you can't find a place to park. Every parking lot on a college campus is park here, and we're going to tell you, but welcome to our fine institution. Well, this one school we visited, we pull into the parking lot, and there's a spot with Stephen's name on it. Stop just dead in, the, dead in our tracks. We go inside. There's an agenda for the day. Stephen's name printed right at the top. Wouldn't it cost this institution to do these two things? A penny, maybe for the paper and the ink? But think about how they made us feel. They made us feel like they were the, like Stephen was the only athlete they were recruiting anywhere on the planet for any sport that they offered. Now, that wasn't the case, but that's how they made us feel. And what happens to us in sales is we get really busy and we have the same or similar conversations all day long. Conversations with 10, 15, 20, 25 prospects and clients, repetitive. But what we fail to recognize is each one of them is only having one conversation with us. And we need to make them feel special. And I'll tell you, David, just one ingredient in my own practice here if you asked any of my clients how many active clients Lee has right now, they wouldn't have a clue because when I'm interacting with them, they're the only one that I have. And that may seem subtle, but it's not. It's, it's such a significant difference. When, when you think about people that you enjoy doing business with, price is not part of the conversation. It's the experience that you have in working with them, and that's why you continue to buy from them. That's why you refer your clients to them. It's not the price, it's the experience that they have. Yeah, so, so important. Well, let's, I wanna go behind the scenes and then we'll come back to some sell different strategies. Uh, because obviously you, you have speaking tr clients, training clients, consulting clients, walk us through the Lee Salts empire. So let's say that someone calls you and says, right. hey Lee, we have a big association meeting. We'd love you to be the opening keynote. Walk us through just some of the touch points that have that wow factor when people want to hire you. Well, I'm going to give you an example in the context of a keynote I did two weeks ago. 
One of the questions that I always ask when I'm talking about uh, contracting for a keynote is imagine I'm done. I'm packing up, I'm leaving the room, your meeting's continuing on. I accomplished success for you if what happened. This was a great talk if I accomplished what on your behalf. So I capture that up front and I make adjustments to my talk so that afterwards, what happened was I got big hugs from their executives saying, oh my gosh, it sounded like you were one of us. And that wasn't accidental. Like they thought, even though I asked that question, they thought it was a coincidence that my talk, and I'll give you an example. Um, I use an expression in my talk, discovery. It's a very common sales expression. But they don't call it discovery. They call it diagnostic. Well, I changed my entire talk, both visually and, and verbally, to use the word diagnostic. So it connected with that audience. And so that's when we talk about creating the experience, they came away going, okay, we want to do more with you. Um, tell us about the workshops you offer. Tell us about the consulting um, that you have. By the way, let's talk about you doing a roadshow with us because we're continuing to do acquisitions. So when we talk about that experience, and, and I use them as an example. And all the interactions I had with them, ask them how many clients I have, they wouldn't have a clue. Yeah, amazing. This reminds me, again, just funny, funny things that make a big difference. I was talking to, and this is also a little bit strange in the virtual world that we're in, but I was talking to a company and in their email signature is their street address. And they were doing me a favor. Uh, it was an introduction type situation. So I email them back right away and I say, by the way, are there people in the office right now at this address? They go, yeah, yeah, there's kind of, you know, a skeleton crew here and, you know, we're, we're actually in the office today. I was like, okay, great. And this was like 11 o'clock, 11 o'clock Eastern time. And we were kidding around about thank you for all of that and a plate of tacos. So I go on to Uber Eats and pe people might not know this, no matter where you are in the US, you can Uber Eats into any location. So I put in their location. I found the nearest taco place, not a Taco Bell, but a nice taco place. They did delivery. An hour later, a plate of tacos, real plate of tacos arrives at the office these people lost their minds. They were taking selfies of them all around the conference room table, <laughs> eating the tacos. This is something that they will never forget because I'm taking a page out of the Lee Salt's playbook and saying, what's going to make me more memorable than the next salesperson or that the next consultant that they might connect with an introduction or a referral or a kind word or anything? So it's these little gestures that have this outsized impact on how we're perceived, yes. correct? Absolutely. I, I describe it as little things that you can do that have a magical impact on your results. Yeah, really, really powerful. And there, again, what's the cost of that? 20 bucks for a plate of tacos. The right. value is in the thousands. Right, absolutely. So there's a talk that, uh, the talk that I did for them and I'm doing a lot of these days is around what I call move the sales needle. Because if you look at what a lot of salespeople do, they come into a program like that and they sit there like this. Yeah, the prisoner. I've been selling 10, 15 years. What's this guy going to teach me? Or they come in saying, okay, I'm going to start all over again and I'm going to listen to this guy, clean slate. Neither of those are the healthy approach. Whether you read a book, go to a keynote, go to a train, whatever it might be, it's looking for opportunities to move the sales needle. Things that you can add to your selling repertoire that will help you have incremental gains. And the way I bring this to life for salespeople is, what if you could be 10% more effective in the discovery phase? In other words, 10% more prospects go to the next step. And 10% of those go to the next step. And on and on and on, just 10%. Multiply that number at the end to how many more sales you'll have, what that translates to in revenue, and what that means to your bank account. Little things you can do, incremental gains. Yeah, really, really big. Let's go back, and I know one of the, you have a video on your website, and this is a whole chapter in the book. It's about competition. Who is our biggest competitor? 
Because I think every marketing coach, every sales trainer says, well, do a competitive scan. Who are your direct competitors? Who are your indirect competitors? Who are the alternative service providers that do something like you do that might help solve the problem? And well, your theory is none of those are the competition. Right. Talk about have, the, the real competitor and how you came to that. I am truly different on this subject, David. Because I have a perspective on this. I wouldn't even call it a theory because I'll, as I explain it, you'll, you'll see it's not a theory at all. Um, I haven't heard anyone else see it through this lens. So when, when I ask audiences, who's your biggest, toughest competitor? And they'll list three big players in their space. And I'm sure those are tough competitors, but there's one even tougher. And someone will go, oh, you mean that old sales trainer one, the status quo, the choice to do nothing. Also, a tough competitor, but there's one even tougher. And then they'll get really quiet for a while. And then someone will go, oh, I know what it is. It's me. See, if I don't have the right mindset, I can get in my way and I can be my toughest competitor. Now it's true. If you don't have the right mindset, you can get your own way and of course cause failure. But there's one even tougher, David, more formidable than any of them. And I give the audiences a chance to tell me who that is. And not once have they ever answered it correctly. The toughest competitor that you face is every salesperson calling the same person you are trying to get a meeting. See, we think about competition in an egocentric way. We think about it from our side of the desk. Put yourself on the other side of the desk. You're trying to reach CIOs. Well, CIOs are getting inundated with calls and emails from salespeople representing their entire purview of responsibilities and beyond. And what does every one of them want? A meeting. And I'll give you a little history lesson because I was a history major in college. I told you that, David. In the entire history of business, there has never been an executive hired for the sole purpose, the sole reason of meeting with salespeople every hour on the hour, not even procurement. So we're an interruption because there is no executive staring at their phone going, oh my gosh, I hope a salesperson calls me right now. So we have to be different in that initial interaction if we're going to get that meeting. So the bad news is you're not competing against a couple of players in your space. You're competing against hundreds, maybe thousands of salespeople trying to get the attention of the same person that you are. So you've got to be different right in that first interaction. You have to pique their interest or you're going to get buried with the rest of them. Yeah, really, really profound. And would you say, Lee, that it's also every bad sales experience, everything where they've been pushed and manipulated and conned and lied to? So it's not just other sales people trying to get the meeting. It's other bad sales experiences where they felt burned and let down and disappointed. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we were talking about Steve and I have another son, David. Sound familiar name? Yes. <laughs> So he's also a college baseball player, a nationally recognized pitcher. When he went through the recruiting process, there was a school that had been interested in Steven. Um, they said the words, but they treated him like a number. Mm -hmm. So much so that when David went through the recruiting process, that school wasn't on his list to consider. So when you treat someone that way, it doesn't just kill this one deal. It's like the old shampoo commercial. They told two friends and so on yeah. and so on there's a mushroom effect. Yeah, absolutely. I want to just go back and because I now at this point, all of our listeners are going, oh no, I've screwed this up for so long. I've lost so many good <laughs> deals. I've lost so no, many no, good no. prospects. What are your thoughts? So let's say that, you know, we're just human. We're human salespeople. We're human professional services sellers. Um, is there a client reactivation approach that once we once we fully embraced the sell different philosophy, can we go back to folks that have said no to us before? Can we even go back and do a client reactivation campaign of clients who maybe left us because they felt like a number, they didn't feel this was adding any significant value? What are your thoughts on sell different as far as client reactivation? Great question. The answer is yes, with a caveat. The caveat is if you believe you can do it. If your mindset is, nah, they're, they're, they're gone. They're never coming back. I screwed it up. You're right. If you believe that there's an opportunity to re-engage with them, 
and potentially bring them back into the fold, you're right. So whatever is in your head, whatever you believe, that's what's what's possible. Yeah, amen. Amen times 10. Let's talk about one of the big myths, one of the big lies, especially in professional services, especially in consulting and accounting and law firms and all of these people who are in the business of selling their expertise. They will say to you, well, Lee, you know, we don't really need to worry about sales because our business is pure referral. You know, we have a referral based business. We use word of mouth. We put out an awful lot of content. We're blogging our faces off. We have an amazing newsletter. We're putting out all of this social media wonderfulness. Sure. You should see our YouTube channel. Oh my goodness, is that awesome. Yeah. So the folks that are sort of deluding themselves by saying, we're just gonna wait for the referrals to come in. We're just gonna wait for our social media to kick in. What's your take on that? Is outbound actual old school, new school, smart school prospecting, is that dead? Great question. So um, there's a consulting firm, and I don't know if you're familiar with them, the, the Rain Group. Are you familiar with sure. them? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So they took this issue on because when you ask salespeople about prospecting, they roll their eyes and they say, oh, it's all referral and social selling. It's all on LinkedIn. So they studied this. They asked executives if they had ever taken a meeting with a salesperson who would reach them through some form of prospecting. And I love asking audiences this question, David. What percentage said, yes, I took a meeting with a salesperson that reached out to me through some form of prospecting? And for our listeners, I'd like you to think about what your answer would be. Because here's what I heard a week and a half ago. 5%, 10%, 0%, 1%. .1. The answer was 82%. 82% of executives said, yes, I took a meeting with a salesperson who reached out to me through some form of prospecting. But the study didn't stop there. They took it to the next level and they found the key ingredient, the secret sauce to getting the meeting. You know what that was? Personalization. If you treat people like a number, meaning you, I mean, there's all these tools out there to automate prospecting and automate sales. Now you're treating people like a number. And so if you have a mechanical way that you are sending out emails or voicemails, just everything is generic, or you reach them live, God forbid you reach someone live for a conversation, and you're having a generic conversation with them, you are not going to be in the 82% group. I mean, I'll give you an example. Just today, I, I got an email from someone on LinkedIn trying to sell me something related to... Um, some government kickback. It's not the uh, the PPP, but something else. But you had to have employees. Well, I don't have employees. It's me, myself, and I. Right. And I very politely said, no, thank you. And she emailed me back, how come? And I just wrote back, and she responded to this, because I don't have any employees. Spend one second on my website. That's abundantly obvious. Yeah. And And so she sent me Copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. Instead of taking a moment, let me see what, what this guy does. And if there's a correlation, a connection between what I offer and what, what he does. I mean, I get emails saying, hey, we can help you develop sales compensation plans. And I said, oh, thank goodness, because now I don't have to do it myself anymore. Well, by the way, I get paid to do that. Yeah. So research and relevance, research and relevance. You know, it's funny, I, 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 um, with clients, I will tell them, show me your outreach message, show me your email, show me your LinkedIn message. And they go, well, David, I'm sending this. And the sentence that they did not complete is, I'm sending this to everyone. And I'm like, uh, that's not good. outreach, that is spam. That's not outreach, that's spam. If you can copy and paste the same initial prospecting message to more than one prospect, that's your clue that it's exactly what Lee is talking about. It's generic. It's random. It's not personalized. It's not customized. You've done no homework. You've done no research. So talk about the sell different approach to research and relevance. How much research? What kinds of things are we looking for? And where are we looking for it? Great question. So I'm going to break your, your question into two parts, because when we think of prospecting, we need a strategy for the qualitative outreach and the quantitative outreach. 
Yeah. So in Sales Differentiation, my prior book, I put together a strategy that's presented there on how to develop a strategy for the qualitative side and sell different. And you mentioned this earlier with the prospecting rhythm is having a strategy for the qualitative side. A lot of times we work really hard on, on the, the qualitative, not on the quantitative. And quantitative means you don't just make two calls or send three emails and say, well, I guess they're not interested and I'm done. You need a strategy, a framework, a creative way to reach elusive prospects. And that's what that prospecting rhythm is all about. Let's talk about the qualitative side now, because that, that was your question. So, David, imagine it's two in the morning. There's a pounding on your front door. It's the police. They want to have a conversation with you about a crime that's recently been committed. Now, they don't randomly pick you and your home for this conversation. What do they do? They analyze the evidence, which led to them put together a crime theory that has led them to you for a conversation right now. So you can see where we're going. A sales crime theory. See, I ask audiences, raise your hand if you love cold calling. And that maybe one or two hands go up and I go, oh, baloney, no, you don't. But there's someone that hates it more than salespeople. You know who that is? Could it the be the prospect? The people on the other end of the phone. The people who we make to feel like the sales call of the moment, there's only one reason we're calling. It's because we need a commission check. That's it. We've done no homework, no preparation. So if the sales crime theory is founded in the answer to this question. And you're not going to pick up the phone. You're not going to send a prospecting email until you have this answer. Why should they want to have a conversation with you right now? Not why should we talk with them? Again, that would be egocentric. Why should they want to have a conversation with you right now? So we need to identify the types of sales crime theory evidence that if we came across it, would say, ah, they should want to have a conversation with me right now. So let's say, for example, we sell technology for conference rooms. What types of sales crime theory evidence, if we came across it, would say, ah, they should want to talk with me right now? So let's see, an acquisition, a relocation, a new executive being hired. If any of those things are going on, they're probably talking about the technology in their conference rooms. Well, since that's what we do, they should want to have a conversation with me right now. And again, we don't pick up the phone. We don't send an email unless we can answer that question. Yes. Well, speaking of phone, let's bust some more myths around this because I know that all kinds of sales gurus have all kinds of crazy answers. Uh, this is about voicemail. Always leave a voicemail. A voicemail is like a 30 second radio commercial. Never leave a voicemail. A voicemail gives you a chance to be ignored. Uh, voicemail is terrible. Voicemail is awesome. Voicemail is your best tool. Voicemail is so 1994. Stop leaving voicemail. What's yes. the real deal on voicemail? Yes. Um, I'm pretty controversial on, on this one. Because just like you're talking about, it reminds me of the old uh, Miller Lite commercials, Taste Great, Less Filling, you know, the back yeah. and forth. And that's what you have with, with salespeople and even people in, in my space. And my perspective is we need to take off the table a return call. And here's, here's how I, I bring that out. I'll ask audiences, imagine we're done here. You check your voicemail and there's a message from a salesperson that says, hey, uh, give me a call. I've got $1,000 for you. Are you calling? And they say no. How about if there was a message saying I can reduce your cell phone cost by half? You're calling them back? No. How about if the message was I can reduce your interest rates by 3%? You're calling them back? No. I've offered you money. I've offered to reduce your costs, and still you said no. What can I possibly say in a voicemail message to get a return call? And the answer is nothing unless you have serendipity. What I mean by that is I happen to be looking at my cell phone bill saying, boy, I should start looking at some alternatives, and you happen to call about cell phone. Oh, perfect timing. Yes, I, I might return that call. Beyond that, it's not going to happen. So let's take that off the table. So based on that, David, you're probably saying, well, we use anti-voicemail. I'm not. I'm a proponent of it, a huge proponent. Yeah. But I think we need to think different about the way we use voicemail. Let's take off the table. We're not getting a return call. Of course, you still leave your contact information. What I'm going to do is leave a message that sparks interest, wets their whistle. 
so that when I connect with them live, they have some context for the conversation. I might also reference in that voicemail an email that I sent or I'm going to send right afterwards because we're battling spam filters. So you might have sent the most incredible email like we were talking about before, but it never went to the inbox. It went to junk or went to spam, never read it. Now in that voicemail, you can wet their whistle and say, by the way, I also sent you an email yesterday inviting you uh, to this upcoming event. If you didn't see it in your inbox, make sure you check your spam filter. Nothing that I'm sharing with you works 100% of the time. But if you come back to what I said earlier, it's about moving the sales needle. If everything that we've talked about here today, David, each one of them adds incremental points, incremental percentages of success, add that up, multiply it out, and tell me what that means to your income. Yeah, profound, really profound. I mean, again, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, you end up with double or triple your sales, correct? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, amazing. Tell me a little bit about closing. The only the only word that we probably hate more than cold calling is closing. Go for the close. What's your philosophy on, quote unquote, the close and the whole closing philosophy, the whole closing craziness? Well, I wear clothes. Yes, me too. I don't, I don't do that to other people. I mean, you know, salespeople say they build relationships. They develop partnerships. But I close the guy. I guarantee you no one woke up this morning and said, oh, boy, I hope someone closes me today. Yeah. It's the wrong mindset for them. And it also has a conclusive flavor to it, meaning, okay, I got this deal. I move on to the next one. And what salespeople don't recognize is what I call the business developer's mantra. This is an expression that if you embrace it, will take your success and your income to levels you never dreamed imaginable. You ready? Every deal must yield two more. Every deal must yield two more. What does that mean? There's upsells, there's cross-sells, uh, there's expansion. There's referrals. There's so much more juice to squeeze out of that. And if you see it through the lens of close, okay, it's done. Nothing else to do. We don't have that mindset. And there's what I call the sales EK, EKG effect. You're familiar with that? I am not. Okay, so I work really hard. I get, I get a deal, nice deal, and I get lazy. And I'm not doing anything. Then the sales manager kicks me in the butt and says, hey, you got to start doing something. So I start doing the right things again. Up and down. And I get, right? If you have this mindset, every deal must yield two more. You get a hockey stick effect. If you brought in 10 deals this year, you got 20 next year and 40 the year after. There's this compounding effect. Why do you want to work so hard and have this? You're not moving. You're staying linear. Yeah. You want this. And by having that mindset and holding yourself accountable is interesting. So again, this talk from a week and a half ago, uh, we have a call scheduled for next week. And they said to me, I guess every deal has got to yield two more. So we've got to have that conversation. Nice. It's well, like, this is from the executives that contracted with Right, them. right. Well, the, the clients and the audiences that hire you, they hear this and they go, okay, yes. well, Lee, what else can we do? Because we got to get two more with you. Absolutely. So Absolutely. Talk, talk to us about... What is the post-sale conversation, either about additional work, uh, solving bigger problems, uh, going deeper, getting referred to other business units, divisions, brand managers within the same company? Uh, talk to us about how we have the post-sale conversation that would yield one or two more. Yeah. So the first thing is you want to have that scheduled and not have to chase them. In other words, when you when you have the event coming up, book a meeting for after it and set the expectation. So what we're going to talk about is, uh, is how the program went, feedback you received from the attendees, and if there are other things that we can do together that might help you further what I talked about. Very casual. Yeah. It's not, you don't set this up to be a buying a car sales experience. And if it's if it's not just a one-time training or event, 
maybe it's a consulting program. We're about a yes. month into the consulting. We're about a month into the coaching, but we do put a push pin on the calendar. Hey, in about 30 days, let's have a status check conversation and see how it's going and see where to go from there. Exactly. Got exactly. it. Okay. Uh, you make a really interesting point about pain. This whole concept, find the pain, probe the pain, expand the pain, kick them when they're down, hurt them, uh, find out all the, the things that are missing, funky, broken, and sad. What's yes. your take on that discovery and especially the discovery around the pain points? Well, anyone who's been around sales or business development has heard the expression, you got to find the pain. So then you're having this discovery meeting, this intro meeting, and you find the pain. And you start to salivate a little bit because you're hearing the pain like, wow, this is going to be a good deal. You go home and you're dreaming of all the ways you're going to spend this commission check. Then you get the text, David. After much thought, we've decided to stay with our current provider. <laughs> I found pain. They told me I have to found, find pain. And I did. It's because they didn't take the conversation to the next level. And this is super important. I don't care how many years you've been in sales. I find it's across the board. We're missing this. That next level. Is that pain an inconvenience or is it a problem? And those aren't synonyms. An inconvenience is a nuisance. We live with it. We deal with it. We complain about it. And we don't do a darn thing about it. A problem, we got to do something right now. And we're willing to invest time, resources, and dollars to address it. We have time for a story? Sure. Excellent. So sleeping right behind me, <laughs> upside down as a matter of fact, is my puppy Kona, a uh, COVID puppy. We got her. And she is the sweetest thing ever. David, I wake up every morning. She climbs up to the top of my bed, gets on top of my pillow, reaches down, and starts kissing my nose. She's a little cockapoo. Wow. She's the sweetest thing ever. It's great. But she does have an idiosyncrasy. Whenever someone walks by, particularly if they're walking a dog, she goes running into the dining room where we have these three windows, and she runs circles, she's jumping at the window, all worked up. Well, this one day, we didn't open the blinds to her satisfaction. Somebody walked by, and she goes berserk and completely destroyed one set of wood blinds. So in my dining room now, David, I've got a set of blinds, a set of blinds, and a sheet covering the window. And this happened about 10 months ago, 10 months ago. And not a week goes by that Sharon and I don't have a conversation saying, you know, yeah, we've got to go do something about that window. We've got to go online and, and look. Neither of us have done anything. Do you know why? Problem it's not COVID. worth solving. Well, it's, it's COVID. Nobody's coming to visit. Yeah. But I assure you, David, if my in-laws are coming to town, they are not walking in his house and having a sheet on this window. It will have gone from an inconvenience to a problem. Yes. Yes, that's so great. Well, and again, it's it's what are people willing to invest time, money, effort, energy? We can find all the problems in the world and like you said, Lee, yeah, those are problems, but it's not a big deal. You know, the intern handles it or we're we're living with it or yeah, right. you know, Sue has to spend an extra 20 minutes putting a new spreadsheet together because our reporting software is broken. They don't care. So I yes. think sometimes the sales discovery is not just what do they care about? What do they not care about? And where where should you right. stop barking up the wrong tree, so to speak? Well, let's take it a step further. There are times where they perceive it as an inconvenience. But we, because of our expertise, recognize this is a problem. And so we've got two choices. They say, ah, it's not a big deal. And we can walk away from it, which is doing a disservice to the client because we have expertise that they don't. Or we can have a conversation, lead them down the path so that they recognize that. So I'll, I'll give you an example. This is related to the speaking world. Um, I think, you know, I compete in powerlifting, right? Yes. Okay. So about five years ago, New Year's Eve day, I'm training in the gym, having a great workout. I'm getting ready to compete a couple months later uh, in the state bench press tournament. I'm on track to set state records. Middle of my workout, David, I feel this pop sensation in my arm. I completely ruptured my left triceps. Oh. So I drive myself to the emergency room. 
uh, an, an orthopedic emergency room. And the only thing you can get done that day is an x-ray because it's New Year's Eve day. No one's working. They put me in, in a sling, send me on my way. Now, what's interesting about that injury is it hurt like the Dickens for a few minutes, but then it didn't hurt anymore. So, uh, so that's New Year's Eve day. New Year's Day, can't get anything done. On the second, I had to get on a plane and deliver a three-day workshop to a client. While I was there, from my shoulder to my fingertips, my entire left arm turned purple. Remember Barney? I looked like Barney. <laughs> yes. Wow. So I recognize I'm like, okay, I'm probably going to need surgery, but you know, I've got all these speaking engagements coming up. I got consulting and workshops. It really doesn't hurt. Um, so I start thinking, yeah, like end of February, if we should be able to squeeze that in. Dude, so your arm back. is purple. Your arm is purple. This is not disturbing. I understand. It, <laughs> yes, but it really didn't hurt. And I had a full docket. So, what, you know, what do you do? Yeah. So, um, I come back from, from the trip. I go to the doctor and he's like, yep, you're, you're right. You ruptures your triceps. I said, yeah, I figured he says, we got to operate. I said, yeah, you know, I looked at my calendar. Um, let's look at end of February. What availability do you have? And he goes, I'll see you on Monday. I'm like what Monday, this Monday. I'm like, yeah, that doesn't work for me. I've got this full schedule. He says, Lee, here's what you don't understand. Your tricep is sitting up here right now. We have a small window of time to take it and reattach it at the elbow. You would like to use that arm again, right? Yeah. Okay. Then you'll be here on Monday. He has an expertise, a medical obligation. I believe in sales. We have an obligation as well yeah. to help me recognize that the lens that I looked at this issue through was incorrect. We have a greater expertise in the world of potential solutions than the people we sell to. This is our area of expertise. If they see it through the lens of an inconvenience and we just let it go because we're afraid of upsetting the apple cart, you know, they're going to get angry at us. We've done them a disservice. Now we can't lecture them. Nobody likes to be lectured. But we want to do is ask thoughtful, insightful questions, lead them down the path so they see what we see. Very, very powerful, for sure. Well, as we're closing, I know that you have a strategic selling opportunity that 99.99999% of professional sellers miss, and they totally don't get it. They don't totally don't see it. What is that strategic selling advantage that we can give them? Well, I'll tell you, David, this is one when you said 99.999% of salespeople don't do it, but they should. That's a conservative number. I believe it's much, much bigger than that. Yeah. So imagine we have this wonderful discovery meeting. We found pain and the pain, it's problems. So now we're really starting to salivate. We positioned our differentiators. They ate them up. I've got action items. They've got action items. This deal's so good, we can taste it. As we head back to our car, we're thinking about this meeting and it plays in our head like our favorite movie, Caddyshack. Not that you asked. <laughs> Here's the flaw. We think that they remember that meeting just as vividly as we do. It doesn't dawn on us that after our meeting, they had six other meetings, 125 emails, 16 voicemail messages, each one of it laying, layering on top of our meeting, making it a distant memory. Are you familiar with Herman Ebbinghaus and the Forgetting Curve? I am not. Have you ever heard of that? No. Look this up. So this was uh, a researcher back in the 1800s, and he created something called the Forgetting Curve. What he found was that people forget 50% of what they learn in 24 hours and remember less than 10% a week later. So let's do the math. You had a one-hour meeting. They remember 30 minutes of it the next day. Less than five minutes of it a week later. So here's the opportunity that salespeople miss. The recap email. Sent the same day as the discovery meeting. And it's structured in five parts. Your objectives. What it is that they said they're looking to accomplish. How we can help. This is the synergy between what they're looking to accomplish and what you provide. What I said I'm going to do. 
what you said you're going to do, and what we agreed to do next. And you write that in such a way, because you know there's other people involved in the decision-making process, that it can be shared with others. So now they get just as excited and up to speed. And one of the things this also does is it shortens the sales cycle. Well, how does it do that? How many times have you had a follow-up meeting and they were supposed to do several things and you get there, David, that's right. I was supposed to get this and do this and talk to this person. I forgot. I'm sorry. So everything gets spread out. Totally. And yeah. to, to finish where we started, there is no CRM on the planet that can write that for you. You got to do it yourself. It's manual. So you make them feel special because you took the time, you invested those minutes to pen this email showing genuine interest in the account, which again helps you to stand out from the hundreds, maybe thousands of salespeople also trying to get their attention. Totally love it. Man, gem after gem after gem, Lee. Thank you, thank you, thank you. As we're closing, tell people where they can get connected and stay connected to more Lee Salt's brilliance. We're going to put these links in the show notes right under this episode. Where can we send them? What can they get? Okay, so uh, I've got a few things. You know, one of the things my clients have asked me over the years is, boy, they say, it would be great if that expression was on like a one page or a poster that we could hang or, or put in the cubicles. So I did that. And I bought the domain Lee's Lesson, not lessons. Like, believe it or not, I couldn't get Lee's Lessons. Somebody already owned it. Lee's Lesson.com. And you will find these one pagers. You have no form to fill out. And it just has my takeaway messages that, again, will help you incrementally grow sales. If you're intrigued by the book Sell Different, if you go to selldifferentbook.com, you can download the first chapter free. Uh, the print and the audiobook first chapter are available there. And if you decide to purchase it, wherever you purchase it, come back to selldifferentbook.com. There's a link there to sign up for the video series. Every week for a year, you'll get an email with a link to a video to help you implement what you've learned. Amazing. All right. All of those goodies, every single one, and you should get every single one, are directly under this episode at thesellingshow.com. Lee Saltz, you're a rock star. I appreciate you. Thank you for spending this time with us. Thank you, David. This is great fun.